introduce you. Okay. This is Bruce Yankel of Woodland Records and Original Cast Records. Today I'm happy to uh, talk to an old friend who I've not seen in 20, 30 years, would you say? Do uh, you recall? Oh, I think the last time you were in London was probably on about 10 years ago. But... <laughs> anyway, his name is Mel Atke, and uh, he uh, originally hails from Canada, and uh, he's been very involved in books on uh, talking about Canadian theater and also uh, uh, theater around the world. So Mel, give us, give us an idea of how everything started for you in Canada. Well, when I, I started out in Vancouver, writing musicals there, when I moved to Toronto, first of all, I joined the Lehman Engel workshop, although Lehman had already passed away then. But I met somebody who became my mentor, Norman Campbell, who wrote the musical Anne of Green Gables. And he was the one that really taught me about, you know, that there was a history behind Canadian musical theater. Lehman Engel had always told us to study the work that went before us, but he meant the great Broadway show. And I started thinking, well, we should know about what was happening in our own backyard. That eventually, many years later, led to my first book on musicals, Broadway North, The Dream of the Canadian Musical Theatre. And then um, I met some Australian friends that had read that book, and they said, change place names, and it could be their story. So that got me thinking about uh, another book applying the same principles, except looking at it around the world. And uh, it's now in its second edition and looks at how indigenous musicals are developed, not just in Australia, but in Egypt and Korea and uh, all diverse places. And some of them you'd be surprised to find uh, have quite a strong tradition. And in fact, in some cases, there are songs that we know as standard that come out of these foreign language musicals. For instance, Can you give us some examples? El Condor Pasa, which Simon and Garfunkel recorded, was from a Peruvian zarzuela from 1913. Um, the Glow Worm, which was a hit for the Mills Brothers, was from a uh, musical of Lysistrata from Germany. Um, and of course, um, if you know the film, uh, The Umbrellas of Sherberg, you know, I, I went to see that a few years ago, you know, wondering what I was going to make of a French musical. And I came out realizing that I already knew two of the songs because they had been uh, on the hit parade. So, um, you know, and finding things like that out make it easier for people to connect to it when they realize, you know, that there is actually stuff that they know that comes out of these pieces. But um, my feeling is that people, Asia emerging as a great market. One of the things that Lehman Engel taught was the craft of writing musicals, but he taught them from a Broadway perspective. What I would like to see happen is for people to um, learn the craft, but learn how to uh, relate it to their own Uh, so I'm actually hoping to be able to set up a course or workshop on that that would have somebody who is an expert in the, uh, in the Broadway tradition combined with somebody else whose expertise is in Chinese theater and uh, allow people to Sort of choose what works for them. I just over the last weekend, 
I watched an original Russian musical based on Anna Karenina. Now, I had been involved with two U.S. Anna Kareninas, one that played The Circle in the Square, and Melissa Arakova played Kitty. And then when we did the recording, she took over as Anna, and we had Carrie Butler. But this Russian musical, to me, was fascinating, because I'd never seen anything quite like that, and we certainly don't think of Russia. Russia has never come up with a musical that I, maybe you're aware of it, but I'm certainly not aware of a Russian musical that anyone has heard of. Well, I knew that there were Russian musicals. In fact, I saw one when I was in Korea at the Jeju International Musical Festival. Um, there was a rather infamous incident of uh, terrorists taking over a theater in Moscow that was actually during a uh, production of an original Russian musical. So, <laughs> but uh, there uh, the places that have done shows that have actually traveled to North America. Um, Korea has tried some. Uh, South Africa, of course, has had some famous examples, such as uh, Seraphine. And one that I look at in great detail in my book, a uh, musical from the 1950s called King Kong. Which is, uh, despite the title, it's not about a gorilla, it's about a boxer. Um, and it ran for several months in the West End. There was talk of bringing it to Broadway. It ran longer in South Africa, didn't it? Yes. And uh, there was, and in fact, it was the making of the careers of Miriam McCabe and uh, who was in her husband's position, but uh, Hugh Masekela. And uh, they both sort of took advantage of the success of that to make their escape. Uh, but it's been revived recently in Cape Town in a revised version. And I've been in touch with the uh, lyricist from that show. So a uh, fair amount of detail about it. And it produced a cast recording. Actually, a couple of them. There was one of the South African cast and one of the uh, English cast. So, uh, and uh, Germany, of course, uh, beginning with the trial and the treatment of Hoffa. Uh, you know, it's quite famous for them. The one that I find is funny is that people look on Paris as the place that musicals go to die. And it's actually where they were born. Um, the what, Offenbach? Uh... Yes. What we call uh, musicals started in the 1850s with Offenbach. And they continued to write them, but um, English speaking audiences didn't get them. They sometimes were successful in other parts of Europe, but they were a little too lazy for the what do you think made Emma the douche an Sorry? exception? What made Emma the douche an exception to the rule? Well, you know, um, I don't know exactly, but they were very intelligent with it because they didn't try to anglicize it. They tried as much. They used as a lot of expressions. They tried you. as much as possible to preserve the French character and. That is part of its great success. I'm not sure that the um, original authors necessarily appreciated it. It's uh, Alexander Dreyfus, who wrote the original book of lyrics, didn't think that it would work outside of its particular neighborhood in Paris, because you know the dialect and everything was so specific. But uh, obviously, he was wrong. <laughs> Um, and uh, while the writers of Les Miserables claim that there was no French tradition, I argue that there is a French tradition and they were part of it. The whole uh, chanson tradition of the and everything uh, translated into, into 
Piaf actually appeared in a musical in Paris, written by Marguerite Monod, who also wrote Femme de Dieu. And uh, so. Is it know, not true that uh, Les Mis was not popular when it was done? It was only because they made a French album and that got to the Royal Shakespeare that it continued, otherwise we would not know it. Well, it was, I think it was a modest success when they staged it in a uh, stadium there, but even the, even after its big success in Britain, um, it, it had problems when it went back to Paris. But the, uh, I think something happened after World War II that uh, a lot of the writers of French musicals were collaborators, and I don't mean in the book music and lyric sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it got a bit of a bad reputation there. Um, there have been other attempts at writing musicals there. Um, some of them, like uh, Notre Dame de Paris, probably just as well not think about, but it's... Did you see Marguerite when it was done in the West End? Yes, I did. What was your take on that? Um, well, I quite liked it. I don't know that it's ever been done in Canada. No, I think that... I think the... Uh, Boublil and Schoenberg generally write their shows in French first and then have them translated into English. Sometimes, sometimes they do the translating and sometimes they hand it over to other people like Richard Mulkey or Herbert Kretzner or whoever. But, uh, do you, have you ever met Herbert Kretzner? Yeah. I'm a huge fan of Herbert Kretzner and I don't think the average person knows his name at all. Well, as a matter of fact, um, well, I pointed out to Herbert that I have an album of a film musical that he did with Anthony Newley that it turned out that he was just as well the world didn't know. So, An erroneous murder never forget. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. He kind of rolled his eyes. But some of the lyrics said it was a strange movie, you know, mis yeah. mis misguided movie, but... Uh, but on the day that my father was having a quadruple bypass, I walked past the Royal Albert Hall, and Herbert Kretzmer was standing out in front of it, and he looked at me and said, say, aren't you Mel Atke? And I thought, that's, that's the sign that God is in his heaven and all is well with the world. <laughs> so um, I haven't heard anything from him lately, of course, he's well into his 90s now, but uh, you know, I have I have on my site, I have two of his early musicals, Our Man Crichton, and particularly uh, The Four Musketeers, uh, which is my favorite English show of all time, Harry Seacombe, and are you familiar with that score? Do you know the opening number? Where I, Harry, I'm not, no. But, it's a beautiful it's so clever and wise, you know, the young boy has all these ideals and, uh, you know, uh, they're all put down as, uh, you know. He's, just... he's actually um, originally South African. So... Um, Her Herbert is? Yes. And uh, so he knows all about things. And he, like... was, he was a reviewer for years. He yes. was a reviewer and not uh, involved in musicals. I, I can't remember which paper he he wrote for, but uh, but he's he's always written lyrics too. But uh, of course, since Les Mis, he hasn't had to do as much of anything else. You know, not worried about where his next meal is coming from. <laughs> tell, tell us about some of your musicals and uh, where they were done. And at the um, end of the program, we're going to play some selections. Well, I've had. The only shows that I've had really properly produced were um, two in New York, one of uh, O Pioneers, 
and the other of a little princess. And this was working with a fellow named Bob Sickinger, who used to run a theater company in Chicago. And one of the people who got his start there was David Mamet, who claimed in an Esquire article that Bob Sickinger was the greatest director he ever knew. And the two guys that wrote Grease were also in his company. Greece is kind of an outgrowth from it. So, um, so that was interesting. I've also had a show called Perfect Timing, which is a two-hander, which we did a very well-received showcase of the uh, Greenwich Theater. But unfortunately, um, not much of any uh, producers came out to see it. You know, they, they keep saying they're, they're just is no new talent or anything in, in Britain, but how would they know? They don't look at it. So uh, perfect timing. We're just now starting to talk about uh, possibly doing it online. So because it would be so easy to do, it's just a two-hander and there's not much of any sense. songs from that. And uh, of course you released the uh, recording of The Little Princess. So you is that done at the Theater for the New City, is that where it was performed? It was, no, at Wings Theater. Wings. Yeah. What what you have that we uh, put out was the, uh, the demo that, that we made that had most of the But that was a few years ago. While while we were doing um, a little princess, I managed to sneak off to uh, a preview of a new musical by the guy who had been my mentor, Stephen Schwartz, called Wicked. And of course, you know, when I saw it there, we had no idea of the behemoth that it was going to turn into. So, uh, but it's uh, interesting. Somebody made an audio of the world premiere performance in San Francisco, and the audience was cheering at the first time it was ever done. So that that's a real good indication that things are going well. Yeah, and and I think in the uh, original production, the um, the wizard was played not by Joel Gray but by Robert Morris. Robert Morris. He had some difficulty with his lines. Yeah. Um, I know that uh, that show went through its struggles in its out of town trials. I don't know too much of the nature of that. Because, it's, because, of course, it's not certainly exactly what's in the book. The book is very dark. And if you were yeah. to do a, a, a literal telling of that story, I do not believe there would be success. Yeah, and the um, the show they discovered there was such a good chemistry between Kristen Chenow and Adina Menzel that uh, the role of Galinda was greatly expanded through the show. Uh, one of the things I do remember thinking after seeing Kristen Chenow in it is that I really felt sorry for for whoever was going to replace her because she has such a unique vocal talent. One of the few people that can do pop music, she can do musical theater, she can do opera, and she has voices for it each. She comes she from Oklahoma. Together. And she comes from Oklahoma. You wouldn't think that uh, people from Oklahoma would be likely uh, to succeed the way she has. And uh, But she, 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 she can do it all, and she's been on television shows and movies and yeah. Yeah. So anyway, um, but it was interesting to see a show like that um, and form your own opinion of it because there's been no hype. So, um, you know, I have my own feelings about Wicked that are not influenced by the fact that it's 
like other shows, a huge monster hit by the time I got to it. So, uh, but Stephen Schwartz was somebody who actually it was through you and your doing the Baker's Wife Countdown when I was doing a radio series in the early 1980s. I managed to uh, <clears throat> call him at home at a time when he wasn't doing much. And, uh, and after that, I ended up sending him um, demos of my own work, to which he wrote me a letter saying, such talents are rarer than you know, which has kept me going through many a dark period. And there's been lots of those. But at that time, he was considering checking it in. He's a musical writer. He was, you know, uh, the baker's wife had not succeeded, neither had working. Um, stuff like that. So he, and he was, had a big film career, so he had you know, alternative that he could have gone in that direction. Yeah, but that, that hadn't happened yet. The only thing that he had done was the television version of work. He had had ideas that he was going to be a director. And then uh, we tried that a couple of times. Didn't like that. So um, he wasn't sure what he was going to do. But one of the things when I read Carol Desjardins' um, biography of him, she said that one of the things that uh, kept him going was the fact that there were people back then that would send him their work that, you know, kind of reminded him that he had an important old play in the world. So now he's through ASCAP doing that with lots of other people. But uh, so you know, I was I was one of the ones that was sending them the work at a time when uh, not a lot of people were doing that. So anyway. Um, you could tell us about Shakira. Shakira was the was my first musical doing book music and lyrics. And it's actually based on stories that my father told me when I was a child. He, my, my uncle had given me a toy tiger. My father made up a character. It was this tiger called Brady Cat, who was scared of his own shadow. And uh, so, the late 70s, early 80s, I started work on that as a musical. Um, but the furthest that's ever gotten was a uh, radio production on a university radio station in Toronto. It's never been done on stage. Yet. Um, I keep revising it, but um, you know, at the time that I was coming through, they just were no producers. And uh, I know Hal Prince, when somebody had said something about that there were no new writers coming up, he said, that's not true. The problem is that there are no producers. And like I said with the showcase of perfect timing, we, uh, we put on our showcase and no producers come. So, um, you know, but these things lay undiscovered. So where where are places that you could get the two books? Let's give a little plug for the two books. Amazon, uh, um, is that the best place? Get you, can get you can get them on Amazon. Broadway North was actually published by a trade publisher in Canada um, called Natural Heritage Books, which is now Dundurn Books. And so at least in Canada, you can, you know, there's lots of books for it. Um, A Million Miles from Broadway, Musical Theatre Beyond New York and London, which is my current book, um, is available online through Amazon or through uh, Lulu.com. Um, and you can get it as either a print book or as a download. 
I think I, I will try putting it on the Footlight site too and see if I can sell a few copies. Unfortunately, people don't come to Footlight uh, to look for literature, so it's a rare book uh, that sells, but uh, I would certainly like to offer it. Well, the thing is that um, I think that it is very important right now, particularly as uh, musicals are kind of re-emerging as an international form, especially in Asia. And uh, in Korea, they're extremely popular. And they're going very heavily into uh, turning Korean movies. When I was at the Daegu International Musical Festival, there was one musical from Shanghai, and I couldn't understand the text within Chinese. They had, they did have subtitles, but they were <laughs> too far away for me to read. Uh, but it had the most stunning visual design. It was all virtual scenery uh, projected on the screen. And it made the whole show seem very cinematic. And it wasn't, it wasn't just a sort of a, um, you know, toys to play with kind of concept. It really defined the way that the whole show moved and worked. And uh, I don't remember who the designer but they were confused. And uh, I was just left to gasp watching it. And this is, this, was, is this Forbidden City or is Forbidden City no, something else? Forbidden City, which was in English, is uh, Singapore. And uh, that's. That was very taken with the song you were on another radio show with Stuart Brown. Was that Stuart Brown yeah. you did? Interviewing yeah. you played that. That song, I thought, God, what, what a wonderful song! Is, is the entire yeah, score as good as that one song? Yeah, the um, the composer is a Korean or a Singaporean um, pop singer named Dick Lee. Now, when I went to Singapore, I was a stopover on my way to Australia, and I met with a group there that write musicals, and they said that you really need to get in touch with Dick Lee. And I thought, okay, fine, how am I going to do that? I found his website, sent him an email, and I immediately got a response back from him saying that he happened to be in a stopover in London right then if I wanted to come over to his hotel. So I went there and interviewed him. Then he told me that he'd worked with a Japanese director called Emon Miyamoto, who had brought a uh, Japanese production of uh, Pacific Overture to New York and did quite a sensation with that. He said they needed to talk to him. I went, fine, how am I going to do that? I found out that he was directing this revival of the Fantastics, which was the next show coming into the theater that I was stage doorkeeper at. And I thought then, God must want this book to be written. <laughs> you know, when he sets up things like that for me. And, uh, and in fact, when the Fantastics came in there and they had a, you know, all-star cast and this famous Japanese director, and I, at the stage doorkeeper, was the only person connected with it who had ever met Harvey Schmidt, composer. And that was about 10 or 15 years earlier. Uh, I met Tom Jones and Harvey Schmidt in New York, where I was trying to get permission from them to do a Schmidt and Jones review in London, which sadly never transpired. But, uh, but I met them, and Jones and Schmidt are among my favorites, I think. Uh, especially 110 Shades, one of the most underrated shows ever written. There's actually in A Million Miles from Broadway, although it's mostly about 
shows outside of the U.S. and Britain. Um, I focus on two American musicals that are both um, have a regional setting and are written by people who are from that region. And those shows are 110 in the Shade and The Music Man. And I said, coincidentally, they share almost the same plot. They're both about a con man coming to town and, uh, you know, getting involved with the local spinster and, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, the Music Man was actually written before the play that I'm going to the shape is based on and open. So uh, they're quite independent and extremely different. But both of them, 110 in the Shade is a Western in the style of Oklahoma, except for the fact that it is written by people who are from Texas and who have intimate knowledge of the sort of cultural milieu of Texas. So there's a, uh, much as I admire Oklahoma, 110 in the Shade is kind of an authenticity. that Oklahoma doesn't necessarily have. So, and uh, the music man, you know, the, when they talk about, I, I read some analysis up somewhere where they talk about uh, the Iowa stubbornness. Now there is no Iowa accent or anything that you can use, but Meredith Wilson um, made the song Iowa Stubborn, the melody itself, is stubborn. The way that it moves rhythmically, it, you know, illustrates that. And, and another point they made was that every problem in the Music Man is solved musically, which is uh, quite clever. And uh, although he did have a collaborator, Franklin Lacey, I think it was, on the story, um, Meredith Wilson wrote the book Music and Lyrics, which is also another kind of rarity. Um, some people in the business frown on that, and I can understand why, but to me, when one person is writing everything, you get a different sensitivity. It's like um, uh, with Guys and Dolls, Frank Lesser, wrote music and lyrics. And to me, I look on Adelaide Lament. Adelaide's Lament is an example of a song that could only be written by a single person. Because it's not a funny lyric set to funny music. It is something where half the jokes in the lyrics, half the jokes in the music, and they, and they require one mind to put them together. But by and large, when people try to write folk music and lyrics without help, it does not work. An particularly an original story and then music and lyrics. Uh, yeah, although actually, um, to my way of thinking, an original story is the time when you might most need it to be one person. It just depends. Ideally, with a show, you get the best composer, the best lyricist, the best book writer. Nowadays, that's much harder to do than it used to be. Much harder to find those. Um, but um, I think when you are adapting from another source, all three people have that same source to look to. Uh, if it's an original story, the chances are greater that the uh, three people are going to each have a different vision of what that story is. Um, I, I was friends with the orchestrator, Phil Lang. Yeah. And he had orchestrated Frank Lesser's last Broadway bound musical called Pleasures and Palaces. Yeah. And he said, after the show closed and was deemed not worthy of uh, uh, trying in, in New York, 
all the creative people were on the train back to New York. And they sat around and just idly said, what, do you, what kind of show do you think we were writing? And all the creative people had a different concept. One the comic opera, one something else, you know, you know. And that was obviously a problem because they weren't club, they were writing individual musicals that weren't the same. And it was directed by Bob Fosse, who is not really known for collaborating with his <laughs> writers. Right. Um, that's true. I mean, with um, Tender and Ed, with uh, Flora the Red Menace, part of their problem was that the uh, book writer, George Abbott, just couldn't conceive of anybody ever actually being attracted to comedy. And so he never understood the story. Uh, Kander and Ab later revived the show with a completely new book. And I think it's been more of a kind of modest success. Um, but, you know, this is, when it works, it's great. It has the, uh, the best and everything on them. But look at, um, Anyone Can Whistle, uh, largely the same collaborators as West Side Story, nothing like the results. Um, everybody praises it now because it's a Sondheim score, but I think even Sondheim would say that that and uh, Do I Hear a Waltz are not, you know, well, he says, with Do I Hear a Waltz, there was never a good enough reason. Book writer was the original author of the play it was based on. So it's better left of the play. At least, at least in Sondheim's version. I would love to know what Sondheim's version of Mary Poppins is. But that, that was actually one of his early. Did he want to do it as a Broadway show? Yeah, he wanted to uh, do Mary Poppins. And um, I can't imagine anybody more different from the Sherman Brothers than Stephen Sondheim. But of course, the original Mary Poppins books were much darker than, uh, than what Disney put on screen. I loved it. Did you see the recent uh, Mary Poppins Returns? Yes, I did. What did you think? Because I, I love that. I love that. Well, some people criticized it for saying that there were no memorable songs. Oh, no, um, no, 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 no. I, I disagree. I thought the songs were good. But one of the things I said you have to remember, and I wrote this in my book, is that Mary Poppins, when Mary Poppins was written, their competition was My Fair Lady and The Sound of Music. And um, Mary Poppins Returns has nothing like that. You know, setting the bar musically. Um, so, you know, they're, they were doing as good as, as they could do within the, uh, you know, the limits of what was expected for the show. Um, one of the things is, I'm a great believer in, although hit songs don't come out of musicals anymore, musicals should still uh, produce memorable songs. And because it's through a memorable song that you remember the moment of the show. Um, now, I think the Mary Poppins return does that. But, uh, what, what current shows do you do admire? Um, well, I haven't seen a lot of current ones. Um, I, there aren't many. Um, one of the things that uh, I haven't, I have to confess that I haven't seen Hamilton, although I've heard the score. Um, I, 
am not a fan of hip hop rap. But but there's a lot more to it. The people are yeah. turned the, off by the, that aspect. But what Lin Manuel Miranda does, he does very well, and he is thoroughly grounded in his. In fact, if you've ever seen the YouTube video of his wedding, it's all set to to life and fiddler on the roof. <laughs> And There's a wonderful YouTube video. We hope this will be on YouTube. So if you're watching this on YouTube, there's a wonderful video. There are a number of videos because for no apparent reason, John Kander and Lynn Will Miranda wrote a song together called Cheering for Me Now. Yeah. And it is so brilliant. And the music is the most thrilling. And John Kander in his 90s, has written an extraordinary song. And yeah. the lyric is so moving on many levels because Linwell Miranda does it as Hamilton. And then he does another video where he's Linwell Miranda. And some of the lyric really refers to him yeah. as this up and coming, you know, you know, the enemies I made may march on my parade, but not today. Mm -hmm. And then it talks about immigrants, this thing it says, you know, uh, we fight like a marriage, yet share, yet share the same carriage. It shows people on the underground at the subway. Yeah. That's brilliant. So watch that. Um, one of the things I think that uh, where I say that what he does, he does very well is, um, of course, rap requires a lot of intricate rhyming, which most rap artists do the, do the sledge. Um, not Lynn manuel and, um, One of the things that I'm very strong on is stanchion and uh, the fact that the way that lyrics are sung should correspond to the way that they're spoken. And uh, I think the delivery that's written into the music in Hamilton is very good that way. It's like, you know, it's like a comedian understanding how to deliver a punchline. And, um, and really, not much of it is rap. There's, and it has all kinds of references to other shows. Especially interesting, the 1776. And uh, I think he quotes the sit down, John, line, stuff like that in it. Um, I'm currently working on a uh, musical about, called The Last Queen of Paradise, which is about the overthrow of the monarchy in Hawaii. And I've been using uh, 1776 as a reference point. The book in 1776 is absolutely gorgeous by Peter Stone. Uh, in the fact that everybody knows what the outcome of 1776 is. You still are concerned it's not going to happen, right? It can't happen. Yeah. Because, because what it does is it shows how close it came to not happening. Right. And um, that's one of the things that I've focused on with the last Queen of Paradise is that everybody knows that Hawaii became a state. They don't realize how close it came to not being. And uh, the sympathies lie in the opposite direction there. If you're, you know, with 1776, at least if you're an American, you're, you're hoping that they go through with the independence. Um, with Hawaii, you're maybe not quite so sure. But uh, the, uh, the thing is that in, in the case of Hawaii, it just came down to the prejudices of the era. The fact that the queen of Hawaii, uh, when she was asked whether she would pardon the people behind it, she said that under the laws of her country that they would be banished. But unfortunately, what came out was not banished, but beheaded. <laughs> and because that's how you know, Westerners thought of 
blind to the uh, savages. Although the way that I, I treated it is that the Queen Lilia Kalani was in fact by far the smartest person in the room. <laughs> and, and yes. Just, are you doing book music and lyrics on this project? Yes. Um, I've tried to get a uh, book collaborator and it just didn't work out. So, uh, I mean, Sondheim has had tried doing book with uh, Jimmy Todd and he just found it's too lonely. You know, we, we really need, he really wanted to have somebody else Hugh Wheeler was brought in uh, after. So at one point, it was going to be book music and lyrics by Stephen? That, that was his original idea, starting from what I understand. Um, and it's one of the few shows in which it really was Sondheim. Most of the other, the ideas came from Halston. So I think he saw a production of the play in London, didn't he? Is that not the? Yes, he saw. Um, um, I can't remember the show's name. It was also the second adaptation of um, you know, the legend of King Charles. And it was Bond that had this idea of combining. Count of Monte Cristo, of course, is the, the whole element of him being on his way to Australia and coming back to uh, to avenge what has been done to him. So, um, did you see the recent Sweeney Todd from 2012 in London? Michael uh, Ball? Which one was it? There have been two. Ball and Amanda Ziz. Oh, the Staten. I unfortunately missed that. I also missed the other one, which was with Emma Thomas and Thompson and uh, Jim Turkle, the English National Opera. Um, but um, I would love to have seen it because I love the Nelson. I saw her playing um, Adelaide in Guys and Dolls at the National Theatre. <coughs> Did you see her do do Gypsy? Uh, I saw it on video. Right. Uh, um, with um, with this production of Guys and Dolls, it sounds funny to say this, but this production was so outstanding that I decided I didn't ever need to see that show again because nothing could ever live up to what it had. And uh, while I was at Goldsmiths, we had somebody from. Uh, ATG theaters in there, and they had done the revival of Guys and Dolls from Captain Swayze. And I said that I found this national theater production so good that I never needed to see it again. And she said, unfortunately, that's how a lot of people thought, was that it had been so outstanding that, um, you know, anything else was going to fail in comparison. And, uh, that Guys and Dolls starred uh, Henry Goodman as Nathan Detroit. I'd also seen him in Assassins and City of Angels. And yet when he was brought into the producers in the States the, and then fired from it, the producers said, well, he really isn't a musical comedy performer. He's a classical actor. And I said, he's the finest musical comedy performer on earth. <laughs> what are you talking about? Uh, so, and I've, I've met him, he's been in a couple of plays of production, so uh, there was one time, one time I've gone, gone out to Cafe Nero with uh, a friend from the States, 
So we went in there and Henry Goodman walked in. And he came up to me and said, oh, hi, Mel, and all this kind of stuff. And then I finally turned to my friend and said, I, I can't let this stand. I have to let you know that that never happened. <laughs> I don't, I don't walk into a coffee shop and have the stars of the West End come up and say hello. To me. But, uh, yeah. Well, I, I think we've had a most informative uh, your chat and you'll say, uh, as you're watching this, you'll, you'll stay tuned because uh, my assistant will add uh, some songs by Mel and uh, the song from The Forbidden City also. And uh, I wish you well, Mel. And uh, if you can bring your new show to New York sometime, I will certainly come to see it. Well, I hope so. I hope that there's theaters again to bring them to. So anyway. Thank you for joining us. Okay. Bye-bye.